Oh. Hello. Sarah Louise, welcome Sarah to the Louise. episode. Sarah Louise, that should have been my middle name. Yes, Sarah Louise Whitney Rice. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, it suits you. Yeah. I can't wait to get my last name Rice back. I know. It's a big production. It sure is. I just am now just slowly changing everything back to Rice. And like, I'll be like, eh, the yeah. la- the, I'll do the legal stuff last. I feel like um, it should be not as big of a deal. And it should be kind of like Princess Consuela and Banana Hammock or whatever crap bag that they did on Friends when Phoebe and Mike wanted to, like, change their names. Oh, right. Do you yes. remember that one? Yes. At and first I was like, wait, what the hell is she talking about? <laughs> I was like, like word I'm salad. not familiar with <laughs> Stringing words yeah. together. No, but like, <laughs> I just feel like changing your name should not be such a big production. Yeah. Especially when it involves marriage and divorce. Come on, let's automate this crap. Right, right. I know, it's a whole big thing. But, hmm. How are you one doing? these days. I'm okay. We're just over here. Just over here. Keeping healthy, staying sane. Yeah. I'm very grateful for my outdoor space. Oh, Um, I wish I could give some to each of you if you don't have any. Yeah, I'm jealous of that as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I know. mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. about you. Um, Did, by the way, Bo was going to have surgery. Did that happen yet? Not yet. Um, I went and I took her to my cousin who's a vet, shout out to Holly, at the Topanga (laughs) Clinic uh, or Animal Clinic of Topanga. Um, And uh, it was really cool because I was born in Topanga Canyon. So it was the first time I had like gone back there since I was like a little Mm -hmm. kid. And it was, I I was like, oh my God, I remember all of this. It was really cute. cute. But yes, yeah, so she was hard. like, oh, yeah, you should go, you know, she does more, um, you know, smaller surgeries and things like that and more just like regular vet checkups and, and um, not like the big surgeries because she's not a surgery yeah. center. So she was like, yeah, she's got to go in and she's got to have it, uh, you know, her like half of her ear removed just in case it, you know, it's a good idea to to kind of get all of it uh, just in case, you know, it, so they get all the margins, as they say. So she's going to have her little ear. She's probably going to have like half of her ear taken off. But um, and she'll she, get one of those cones. Yeah. So she's mm-hmm. our. She had the surgery scheduled um, for you know tomorrow, but the doctor got injured or like ha- broke oh, it. Like something happened where the doctor injured themselves or had an accident and is out for two weeks. Oh my god! Yeah, that gives me pause. Right then, I was like, "Whoa, it was maybe there another reason." P A W S. Oh my god, that was cute. <laughs> but uh, maybe they won't give her the cone though, because if it's her ear, well, they have to do a whole bunch of weird taping of it, so oh, so she doesn't Lord shake her head. And it's kind of that's why with because they can shake like that. Mm-hmm. Ears is a really hard one. And I know this because I've tried to tape it myself a million times. No matter <laughs> what I use, I mean, I have like used an entire roll of tape to tape up her ear when she like scratch at it, and uh, in two seconds she just shakes it and it's off. So I'm like, okay, for Pete's sake. So I just put the cone on her and it's mm. fine. The cone of shame. Well, thoughts of thoughts and prayers to Bo. Yes, yes. I mean, she's still happy and healthy and wagging her tail like like you know. It's uh, it's nobody's business, but yeah. The good news is um, they had quoted me because she needs a little teeth cleaning and they like to do that when she's under anesthesia and they had quoted me like $1,000 to do it. And my cousin has a woman at her, her office who is like an animal whisperer and can do all of the teeth cleaning without any anesthesia and just like talks to the animal and relaxes them and can do Come it with on. like feral cats like this woman is like an, a, a, a like my <laughs> aunt was cats. like i've never seen anything like it and so my uh, my cousin was like oh and Bo is a perfect candidate for this because she will yeah, just roll girl. on her back and she will have it done in two seconds no problem out the door it's like yeah do that great so she'll have her little teeth cleaned and you know Bo's getting better yeah, health be care than all new. of us right now. So. <laughs> That's it's crazy. So true. It's really funny. Aww. Yeah, but okay, she's happy. Well. She's super happy. And she's like, oh my gosh, I read the cutest thing. And I don't know if this is real because it was on the internet, but it made me laugh and it was adorable. <laughs> Somebody said that, you know, now that they've been home all, all the time, their dog is so happy and their, their dog's tail was just like wagging like crazy. They couldn't even believe it. And then uh, like a week, a week later, they were noticing that their dog's tail wasn't wagging anymore. And the dog was like looking kind of sad. So they took the dog to the vet, found out the dog sprained its tail from wagging it so much. <laughs> 
I saw that. <laughs> is that not the cutest thing? I I, I feel laugh. like it's false. I don't care. I I don't. I'm gonna believe it. <laughs> I don't. I don't, I don't want. I want. I don't want to live in a world where that's a fake story. That's adorable. I need it to be real. I do think yes. doggies are very happy. Everybody's at home with them. Yes. 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 Oh, and yes. I have a little update from our last episode. Remember how we were talking about um, the preference of of males preference and underwear type. Yeah. I was like, well, I got to ask Ren. So I said to mm-hmm. him, okay, so if I had like, you know, it was me and I would lined up in like the same, you know, pair of underwear, like yeah. which one would you like? And he was like, well, yeah, I don't know, you know. And he said, he gave the best answer. He was like, well, I w- like whatever you feel the most comfortable in, yeah. you know. And then he said, I feel like if you asked a junior high ki- boy, he would have an answer. But a grown ass mm. man doesn't care. Mm, and I was see? like, good answer. Yeah, that's what I'm kind of getting at when I was like, they don't care because yeah, they don't care. what they care about is like your enthusiasm and your yes. sort of sexual energy, yeah. not necessarily what you have on. Yeah, and he was like, if if it were ever like you were, you know, wanted to know what I liked, uh, he would want me to wear what I liked the best. The good man. Yeah, I'm like, oh, okay. Go c- continue. Watch, I'll ask Adam and he'll be like, uh, thong. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I need to be red and lace, thong, <laughs> yeah. come up right here, preferably right. with this soft shell cup and a demi bra. <laughs> that would be hilarious. <laughs> right? Like he'll yes. have all these specifics. Yes, yes, yes. And then I'll be like, well, Ren said. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because sometimes I'll be like, well, Adam said, you know, <laughs> so we'd go, we could use that back and forth. I'll, I'll allow it. I have a question, and this is just because I never see you, so I can't ask you like the normal day-to-day stuff that I would usually ask. And so now we're just doing it on the show. Yeah. Why does it annoy me that when Mm. people use the phrase like so-and-so is a beast? I don't like it. I don't like like when things catch on and then they become the sort of Uh casual uh parlance uh for no reason. Tell me what you think. Okay. Okay. So, what is it that you don't like about it? When you, when I say, so if say we're we're talking about, um, like a, who comes to my mind? Like Tori from the Challenge, and we're mm-hmm. like new Tori, and we're like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, Tori from the Challenge, she's a beast. What mm-hmm. what comes to your mind when you say that? When I say that? Well, I know what they're getting at, mm-hmm. but it feels like you know when something becomes hyperbole or. Um, or cliche. Yeah, yeah. Then it sort of ruins the intended meaning. Yeah. Well, and I feel, so yeah. And it is overused on the channel. all the time. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Same with, uh, um, you know, there were a bunch of those phrases on the challenge that I just couldn't stand. You know, like when they would say trim the fat, that became a thing. Or at the yeah. end of the day. Or, um, you know, <laughs> like those ones. I was like, oh, for Christ's sake, can we use another, can we get another phrase? And then... Yeah, it just becomes repeated over and over and over. And for a while, it was goat. You know, he's yeah, the goat. yep, 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 and yep. It's yep. always a boy that they're talking yeah. about. Um, and then Sometimes, the beast no, thing. Though, I, I don't about know about the goat. Mm, yeah, you're right. They probably wouldn't say that about not as often. Maybe we would. Yeah, we would. Yeah, but the beast thing just feels like. What are you getting at? That she's tough, that she's strong? That I, she, I mean, I don't know. I'm going to say I kind of like that one because I also think that one's the, that's one that's not gendered. Yeah. Because you say like, okay. oh, she's a beast and he's a beast and it's like we, we, it's the same idea and, you know, it's not like she's a beast for – like I feel like better about that one than like battle axe and other ones like that. <laughs> yes, I agree with you on that. Yeah. I just don't like it when it's applied to anybody. I just maybe yeah. it's just because it's overused. Overused, yeah, for well, sure, for sure, for sure. Saying that they're not a beast; they're just like a strong person. You got to think of a I'm new like word. Too literal. Sis, you got it. You got to invent a new word. Okay, I'm going to work on it because now it. we're doing our. Um, you know, on Patreon we have our weekly viewing of the challenge, mm-hmm. which which you guys should watch along with us because it's hilarious. <laughs> um, and they use these phrases all the time. It's what you're saying, where they become like the sort of reality TV competition jargon. Yeah. You know, is there any, like, because I, 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 I think I like the word because I feel like, you know, when I, in certain moments of, you know, my challenge career, maybe somebody would have called me that and that I would wear as like a badge of honor. And so I wonder. And what would if, it mean to you? Like, oh, I was tough. I was, yeah. And so, 
you know, I'm wondering like if if there's like do you feel like somebody will call you a beast? No. Okay, so maybe that's why you don't like the word because you were like, oh, maybe it doesn't apply to me. No, I don't know. I don't. Well, I'm trying to think of like I'm trying to like therap like like analyze this and like you know go therapist route. So I don't do this with you, Suze. Because <laughs> I'm like pissed. She's every like, time no, you that's not it. It's not, not because stupid. it's something that I cannot relate to, and I reject that for myself. It's not that. The, the thing is, I, I if we're going by the the way people intend it, I am that. You are a beast, but no one would call me that. Maybe that's it. So maybe you're just angry that no. nobody's called you a beast. Fuck Susie, no, you're a beast. I don't, Sarah, I am not wishing for that. I can assure you, I'm pretty self aware. Yes, you and are. And I know what I crave, yes, and that ain't it. That ain't it. No. Oh, that's but funny. Maybe our listeners will know what, why it bothers yeah, me. Yeah, I don't know. know. That's a fun one to explore, here. though, because. Because uh, <laughs> it makes no sense, and who the fuck cares? I'm just trying to think um, about things that I like that, that bug me. You're not easily annoyed, though. Not by words like that, I think. But you know, I've already talked about this. I get annoyed anytime something becomes cliche. Mm-hmm. I've already talked about how I hate when women say like so and so's in my tribe mm-hmm. or um whenever they refer to each other as mama. Like I hate all that yeah. subculture. So yeah. it's not just the beast thing. It's <laughs> right. like everything anyone yeah. ever says. You're like, yeah, I hate any of the, the whatever the the popular <laughs> t- terms are. Stop Wait, talking anything to me. anything a- getting added to to Webster's Dictionary this year is on my list. <laughs> that is exactly right. I right? don't like when anything catches yeah. on. Right. Mm-hmm. Anyway, let's move on. I'll move on, okay? <laughs> Fine. Okay. Hey, you know what? Um, if you got stuck, like, hey, this is the place to air out, and, and, and this is a safe place, basically. Thank you, what I'm Sarah. Saying. Safe, safe Appreciate place. Appreciate that. Yes. Okay. I am reading this book called The Body, A Guide for Occupants by the legendary author Bill Bryson. And he is one of my favorite authors. I just adore him. And I'm about, I don't know, a third of the way in, but I have to read a few things to you because, yes, please. holy crow. Okay. So there's it's by section. Mm-hmm. So like they start with whatever, microbials and then they go to the brain and then the head and all this stuff. Okay, so under the microbials, which was particularly disturbing because that's what we're all dealing with with this virus, mm-hmm. um, it was talking about how in Britain there was a research facility that was um, that existed until 1989, and they were trying to find the cure for the common cold, mm-hmm. and they, of course, failed. But they did, in the process, do some really cool studies. And let me read you... One of them. Oh, I love this. I love a study. (laughs) Okay. So they conducted an experiment where they had a volunteer fitted with a device that leaked a thin fluid from his nostrils uh, to simulate a runny nose. And the volunteer then socialized with other volunteers, like kind of like a cocktail party thing. Mm -hmm. And unknown to any of them, the fluid contained a dye visible only under ultraviolet light. When they switched the light on after the mingling, the participants were astonished to discover the dye was everywhere. The, the, it's crazy, those studies. I, oh. On the hands, the head, the upper body of every participant, glasses, doorknobs, sofa cushions, bowls of nuts, everything. And um, that was astonishing, even though we know that that's how germs work. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine if you were one of the minglers and then they turn that fucking light on? Oh, my God. And it's all over you? Oh. Yeah. And it's just a runny nose, man. Oh, my gosh. So, you're welcome. Is it? So. Sleep tight, everybody. Is it that he wipes, like, wipes his nose and it gets everywhere? Or is it that just having. Basically, yeah, that we all touch our face constantly. Oh, my God, and so all the time. It just goes from one to the next to the next to the next. It's exponential and. That's how it goes. Oh, my God. So, that's disgusting. Does that disturb you, though? Um, I mean, it. the thing is, is it, it, it does when you think about it, you know, about something like what we're going through right now. But mm. I also think, you know, germs have always been around. They do serve. We have to look at the other side of the coin that they do serve. Like your exposure to certain things does help build your immune system. There's. There are benefits to like small amounts of exposure to certain things. We don't want to live in a bubble. We know that that's not that 
it's not healthy either. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think, um, you know, we just have to have an awareness. We just have to do what we can and like, you know, wash our hands and, and keep immune systems up and things like that. But like, it's just, that's just like being a human. Yeah, I don't like being a human. Yeah, I know. That's like, what I've it, learned. it is kind of like, <laughs> you know, I, I remember there fan. was, there was like, I went through, I don't know what it was, but like, I, I, I had this like, period of about six months where I was like, oh my God, there's boogers on everything. I don't know, like, like just I remember. mucus on everything. It like freaked me out. And I was like, I can't yes. touch anything. There's boogers everywhere. And, you know, <laughs> and then I was like, I got to let this go. So like I go, and sometimes that's just anxiety over other things that we just like project onto whatever the, the you know, thing in front of us that is easy to point to is. I mean, I as know. you know, I'm not fussy about this stuff. I wear shoes in the house. I do all the things they tell you not to do. So it's not like I'm prone to fear about these yeah, types yeah. of things. But I really just don't want... I pretty much don't ever want to know anything that has yeah. to do with one of those lights. Those B- <laughs> ab- lights that show you like the semen on the hotel bed covers and stuff. I don't want that. No, nope, don't need to know. Yeah, I'll just pretend. Blech. That's why I hate I mean, mysterious wetness because you could see it. mm 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 these are ways that you can get sick, but one way that you can take better care of yourself is by using ritual vitamins. Oh, amen. You this guys? is definitely what you should be doing right now. Come on. Do it. For like a million I keep reasons. I thinking about that. Yeah, because just the way that you have to eat right now is yeah. different than maybe you would otherwise. And I've noticed it with myself that I, when I take my ritual vitamins, I'm like, okay, I'm feeling real good about this because I need all the help I can get. Um, and ritual is great. I, as you guys know, because it smells and tastes like mint. And most importantly for me, it is gentle on an empty stomach. And so it's time released and it doesn't give you that feeling of, oh my gosh, I took my vitamins and now I'm going to puke, which was a p- constant problem for me and why I never consistently took vitamins before. So daily changes can lead to big results. So start small today. Ritual is offering our listeners 10% off your first three months. Try it out. Satisfaction guaranteed. Go to ritual.com slash brain candy to start your ritual today. That's 10% off during your first three months at ritual.com slash brain candy. Um, it's vegan certified, non-GMO, um, has high quality ingredients, and I really recommend it. And I would tell you otherwise. Yeah, it's man. great. Yeah, man. Um, okay, so the next thing I want to read to you from the book. I just thought this was kind of cool because I never thought about it before. Yeah. It was just talking about how, um, like, no matter what color your bar of soap is, like, the lather is always white. Oh, my gosh. I thought that was interesting. That's weird. Yeah, it was just saying how it isn't anything to do with, like, the molecular structure of the soap or anything like that. It's just simply that foam reflects light in a different way. And the reason that they brought it up is... this is cool. Yeah, they were just talking about how, you know, so much of what you think you see is your brain filling in the gaps. Yep, 100%. Um, And that things are subjective and, you know, like whenever you do those optical illusions and things where like you stare at a picture and then you look at a white wall and then you see the picture on the wall. Yep. That's from your eyes and your brain trying to figure out like what it, what's happening in your eyes are tired from the photoreceptors and then so cool. it's just awesome. It like is. what you're, that's why I love this book actually is cause you have such a sense of how powerful and amazing the human body really is. Yes. I was uh, staring out my window the other day and you know, just like, I think it's because I've spent a lot, you know, obviously so much time indoors and your, your eyes kind of just adjust to that sort of light that's much yeah. dimmer than being outside. So I was outside and, you know, just sitting on my porch and, and or my balcony, like staring out at the street. And I had my sunglasses on and I look at the, um, it was like, I was staring at the street and there was a, a, a place like right in the, there was a, a, in my eye line right in the distance where if I move my head up, you know, even just Mm -hmm. one centimeter, I can see the white crossing line, like the the white of the crossing line on the road. Mm -hmm. And if I put my head, lowered my head a little bit, it would disappear. But if I split the difference and was just halfway up, the line would, 
was wavy. The line looked yeah. like it was moving. So, like, you know when you look on a hot day, you look out at the street, and there mm-hmm. are, like, those, those lines, like... It, it, steam. Like, it's not even steam. It's almost just like the heat makes the... Well, yeah, but it looks like that. Yeah, it's like, it makes it look like wiggly. Like, it it, it somehow distorts the, the... your. I don't even know what it is. Somebody smarter than me knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I'm sure there's a name for it. And I was like, oh, is that what's going on? Is it because the pavement's hot? So then I looked at the temperature, and I'm like, it's 63 degrees outside. That's not it. So, like, my it must be my brain trying to fill in the gap from where... I can see it, then I can't see it, then I can mm-hmm. see it, then I can't see it. But it's such a thin line on the road from the distance that where I was that it would just look like it was like moving or like 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 pulsing or vibrating. And I was like, that's so weird because it looks like the the lo- the street is moving. And so my brain, but this, you know, things you do when you're bored and you're staring out. So like, I totally had that like optical illusion. And it's funny that you bring that up because I had like a good 15 minute moment of like just mindfulness and and being present, staring (laughs) out the street. I love, I am all for having moments of wonder. Yeah, that's what I was doing. I am, I think that's the beautiful thing and we really don't do it that much anymore. So maybe that's the silver lining. Yes, absolutely. The silver lining that looks like it's vibrating when you look at it from a different <laughs> Right. Distance. It's all wavy. We it's all wavy. It like, yeah. It's so funny you say that because, you know, I probably wouldn't have had one of those kind of reflective, like con- contemplative thoughts about mm-hmm. that if I didn't, you know, I would have filled my time with like some errand or something like that. So, yeah. It's just weird how though, you know, as I said, the book made me appreciate the amazingness of the human body and brain. But then in other ways, you see like the foibles of human behavior. Like, you know how they talk a lot about how you can kind of implant memories? Yep. That's fucking weird, man. I know. Or how about like our memories of before a certain time, a lot of them are just memories of pictures we've seen of things where we've yeah. created a memory around it from stories mm-hmm. and things it like that. It bothers me because mm-hmm. it feels like what is the evolutionary benefit of that? Because there must mm-hmm. be one that mm-hmm. helped us survive along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, but they were talking about how they will do these studies where they convince people that they've been in a hot air balloon and they met Bugs Bunny at Disneyland, like all these very specific oh things that you would definitely remember, but we don't. Oh, We, that, we believe them. That just makes me think of the, Ren and I were talking about the um, uh, 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 Mandela effect the other day. Oh, I like, yeah. introduced him to that concept. That? I still am like blown away by it and it gets me every time because it's, Tell the it was, listeners in case they don't know. So the Mandela effect is this strange, I guess you can call it a cultural phenomenon, like a, a sociological phenomenon where large groups of people have different collective memories of things than other people. So there's, you know, groups who have a very specific uh, uh, memory of Nelson Mandela dying but he was alive at the time. Or the mm-hmm. big one for me is the spelling of Bernstein Bears. Mm-hmm. That there, it was not spelled like that, but I definitely remember seeing it like that. And there's a whole mm-hmm. bunch of them. Um, like the the other one that was like the Fruit of the Loom logo. Mm-hmm. What does the Fruit of the Loom logo in your mind have on it? In my mind, yeah. it's just like a big pile of fruit. Does it have a cornucopia or no? Um, let me think. No. No. Okay. Well, in my mind, it it does, and it did ne- never did. So huh. I was like, maybe I'm from the other dimension. I mean, maybe yeah. if anybody were from another dimension, it would be you. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, just like you my know? my whole family, my mom. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, she's it's like still halfway there on in that <laughs> other one. Maybe all the way. Who knows? Right, but like in the best way. In the best way. Oh my it's gosh! Absolutely. Thing. I mean, she's so good at that. Like anytime I'm like. You know, um, you know, I wasn't feeling so well the other day and she called me and she was like, here's the deal. You are the author of your own story. Your mind is the most powerful thing. If you say that you are feeling good, you are feeling good. And you just will that, that feeling like right out of you. And yeah, what do you think of I that? did that and I felt fine the next day. So, you See, know. See, because you know how I study the prosperity gospel and that's yeah. the, the idea um, it's like a religious version of the promise or the secret yes, or whatever yes, yes, yes. you want to call it. Um, so yeah, but I don't have to pay inclined. anybody for this. Yeah, it's you just got it for powerful free. thinking. You know. Yeah, 
And I think I our say, brains really are. If it gives really you comfort, are, yeah. then that's great. And if it works, even better. Yes, absolutely. You know, it's kind of like filling in those gaps, but with the stuff that you want to fill it in with, not the automatic <laughs> stuff. Yeah, right. That may not be Pick the right the goodies. info. goodies. Yeah, you got to be in control. I find it really weird, though, like when I was reading through these and you start to see the kind of like anomalies of the human experience and how there's mm-hmm. pretty much a syndrome for everything. Like there's this one syndrome where people are blind, but they refuse to believe it. What? It's called the Anton Babinski syndrome. What? What? Tell me more. It just says... Um, the inescapable fact is that the brain is in an unnerving place as well as a marvelous one. There seems to be an almost limitless, limitless number of curious or bizarre syndromes. And then it listed the Anton Babinski syndrome is a condition in which people are blind, but refuse to believe it. Oh my God. Well, so then what is their experience? Do they see in, in, are they able to somehow navigate the world? Do they think we're all lying? That maybe they think it's false that we can see or something. Well, there's a great, um, uh, podcast at what is, what was it called invisibilia that npr put out yeah. years ago and i think that they they have a few seasons now but there's one episode called called like do we need our eyes to see okay. and or it's like makes that argument i think it might even be called be becoming batman or being batman or something like that but um you know it was a lot of these kind of cases of people arguing that like do we really need eyes our eyes to see and there are people like this who are functioning in the world and, and, and kind of like seeing or interpreting their world in different ways. And yeah, it's just interesting. It's creepy. I love like it. There, another one was like a Riddock syndrome, syndrome. Victims cannot see objects unless they are in motion. What? Well, that sounds terrible. Oh my gosh. And what the hell would that be from? Oh my gosh. There Cat are so syndrome many- is a condition in which sufferers become convinced that those close to them are imposters that one i've totally heard of that's a crazy one no there's this there's a great book out there called um the man who mistook his wife for a hat that's by oliver sacks yes oliver sacks oliver sacks and he is the one um is the i guess he i think is a psychiatrist i believe that they based the movie awakenings off of And if you have not seen the movie Awakenings, oh my God, see it now. It is so good. Have you seen this, Susie? No. Oh, you will love it. It's with um, Dennis Hoffman, I think. And (laughs) wait, um, who? No. What isn't that his name? No. 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 Something. Dustin Dustin Hoffman. Oh my God, (laughs) the actual worst. I like remember everything else about the details of the actual scientist, but I can't remember the freaking actor's name. Ah. So it was a bunch of people who were in a catatonic state and the pe- they believed that they were, um, you know, kind of like they had this locked in disorder. And he mm. discovered that if you throw a- an object at them, they'll catch it. And so they like, what? they are, yes, they are awake in there. And like, it's, it's the coolest movie. You have to see it. But he wrote this book about all of these bizarre cases of people who have brain injuries in very, very specific places that cause these kind of things. Like a man mm-hmm. who really thought that his wife was a hat. Yeah. It's what? sort of sad, but it's also very fascinating. And these are the, the anomalies that teach us so much about the brain. Mm-hmm. And about, you know, it's like the, 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 the things when there's something wrong that we're able to learn more about how it functions when things are working right. This is why, I, this is the same argument, kind of, that I was making about Tiger King, is that most people think it's low-hanging fruit. It's just sort of gross um, reality-type television. But for me, it's like a funhouse mirror to help you see your own humanity totally. and the human condition. Um, and that's a, another example is what you're describing, where something is out of the ordinary for the human, the typical human experience. But it can show you a lot yes. about your own. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was also wanting to mention how it was talking about how faces are so important for the human experience and that, yep. that we're, you know, even as newborn babies, we prefer faces and things like mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. Um, but how, if you show people a picture of a celebrity and you remove their eyebrows, oh, yes. they have a harder time knowing who it is than if you remove their eyes. What? what? I mean, I, yeah. I can... Uh, 
I know that this is, this is true because I yeah. I've seen that like these articles, but it still blows my mind, and I still can't believe that that you need the whole face, that you need that the, the <laughs> eyebrows. God, they serve a purpose. Maybe it's because they're so expressive. Maybe, but and so are the eyes. It, I mean, right? Windows to the soul mean nothing to you people, right? And then it's <laughs> it says that that's one of the reasons the Mona Lisa looks so enigmatic is that oh, she has no eyebrows. Right, right, right. I never thought about that. I did not either. Now, so was that a fashionable thing of the time to pluck all your eyebrows out? There can I? I mean, I guess it's possible, but like. I am not familiar with that trend. Me, me either. No, me neither. Yeah, One trend I am that. definitely familiar with, though, is brushing your teeth. Yep. I am Very all important. aboard that train. And with all this time, I'm taking the full two minutes and doing it three times a day. <laughs> so my dentist is going to be like, your teeth are looking phenomenal. <laughs> my, my son told on my husband and said he does not wait the whole two minutes before he turns <laughs> off his quip toothbrush. Oh my gosh. I was like, A little oh. tattletale. Yep. He was like really Did focused tell him what on happened oral to, health. To snitches? <laughs> well, regardless, if you want to do the full two minutes, Quip has you covered because Quip toothbrushes have the um, sonic vibrations. So it vibrates and then every 30 seconds it tells you, it pauses and tells you to, you know, switch sides. And you can store it on your mirror because the little holder mounts to your mirror and looks super chic and cute. Not like those old timey hideous ones that took up half your vanity. Right. Um, and then they send you the replacement head every three months because that's what the dentist wants. And I keep thinking about that, how like we need to make sure we're keep taking care of our bodies, our uh-huh. teeth, Absolutely. everything. It's really important for like you don't want to have to go unnecessarily yeah. to the doctor yeah. or the dentist. Hey, and they and got a new floss thing out now. What is it? I wanted to know about that. Yeah. It's like a little tool that helps you floss and you can reach all those hard to reach places. Well, I'm all for that. I know. I'm very get passionate one. about flossing. Me too. Um, and I used to floss to- when I drove in the car, so now I need to do it at home and incorporate that into my <laughs> right, ritual a little more. Carve out some time. Exactly. If you go to getquip.com slash brain candy right now, you'll get your first refill for free. You get your first uh, refill free at getquip.com slash brain candy, spelled G E T Q U I P dot com slash brain candy. Quip, the good habits company. Um, I love a good habit. Mm-hmm. I'm very routine, so maybe I'm weird, but... Uh, I, no, you're not weird. That's the best thing to be. We love that. Yeah, right. Thank you. I'm stable, everyone. Mm-hmm. Jeez. Get off my back. Okay, so those are my things from that book. Now I want to talk about how I'm all worked up because I was reading about how, you know, the um, the subway in New York, you know, the MTA is a very popular place to advertise. Mm -hmm. And I had read this article about the double standard of like the MTA um, allowed all these ads about erectile dysfunction, but they wouldn't let things. What? um, Period underwear. Oh, I'm so mad. I love those. Yeah. Or like sex toys (sighs) because they say, you know, it's too sexual. But then you think about all the ads, even oh for like Oh my beer God, there's so cars. many sexual right. like innuendos. It's like, I feel like that's all the ads on the New York subway are. It's just tits. Yeah. Unless and then there are the reminders to get tested and STD testing. That's true. But it's like whenever it's a man, it's fine and that's it's anatomical. Dumb. But whenever it's a female, it's like, that's too sexual. And they're like, oh, nobody wants to think about periods while they're driving. We don't want to think about your freaking erection and their inability to get it up while I'm taking the train either. Right, because the thanks ads were just, um, I guess, visual innuendo because they were just like fruit. And um, I think one was like an egg. Oh, my um, God. And they, you know, they're so implying something. But it's not even explicit. It's just implicit. Who are these? Who are these? jerks making these decisions so they have like a uh, i guess a committee or oh a board or whatever karen decides- <laughs> i think it's karen's husband oh you think it's karen's husband yeah because yeah. i mean dudes are like yeah basically they want women to be super sexual unless it benefits the woman you know we need to have a name <laughs> for them because yes. like we can't just be like saying calling karen's husband because that's like Maybe you know a Roger. negative thing Oh, a Roger. Mm-hmm, Charles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Charles. 
Who do you else think? would be like an annoying guy's name? Gary. Gary. Fucking Gary. See, it's totally Gary. Gary or a Jerry. Interchangeable. Gary. Right? Gary's like, yeah. oh, no, no, no. Gary we or a Richard. Yeah. <laughs> but he doesn't go by dick because that would be too sexual. They, al- <laughs> they allowed ads for boob jobs. Okay. It yeah. is her husband. Fucking A. Gary. <laughs> And even the Museum of Sex was allowed to... I'm so annoyed. ...do an MTA. But, like, periods are icky to them. <sighs> and sex the toys are too... They don't, we don't need a man if we have a toy. Oh, my God. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. And I'm super I'm ragey about it. <laughs> Me too. Oh I mean, I'm glad... I think that Thinks or somebody else sued... The MTA Good. about it. I'm, so I'm, maybe things will change. I'm on board. Not with the MTA, mm-hmm. though. Oh, one thing that w- has uh, lifted my spirits, which is that the New York Post did an article saying that uh, a study of dementia patients found that exercise made it worse. What? <laughs> I mean... That's wonderful news. No, I'm kidding. It, it kind of is. Deme- I mean, Wait, not really, exercise but... Exercise made it worse. Now, it there's got to be a certain point. Like, I feel like it's, like, preventative, but then maybe once you already have whatever that is, then uh, there's... Mm-hmm. Tell me more. There's got to be... Yeah, yeah, maybe you're right, because it was... All the patients were already dementia patients. Yeah. Um, but those who exercised their rate of decline was faster than those who were more sedentary. Okay, so maybe it has something to do because I, I remember reading that it has it, it's linked to some protein mm. in the brain. Mm, that diagnosis. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That, or we were talking about something else, some other article a while ago about the, the things that can prevent Alzheimer's and it was a protein or something like that. So maybe that there's something about exercise burning up that kind of protein. And so unless mm-hmm. you have a lot of whatever that is, like a, 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 you know, a stored amount of that, then that gets depleted. Interesting. I really would not have ever predicted Never, that. Never, ever. And is there a certain kind of exercise? Like, is it, is it just cardiovascular? Is it, is it muscles? Like, is it you know, you know, I don't think it's specified in the article. This is really, I that totally goes to against cardio. everything I would think. Right, because brain health, I mean, it just goes without saying that exercise improves that stuff. Yeah, but then they also, and then, so like, if you pair that with the article that also talks about how wine decreases, like, you know, the <laughs> risks. So really, we're just supposed to drink and be, and do nothing. So it looks like I'm, I'm doing real good. I'm, this is, I'm taking preventative measures already for my brain health right now. Isn't that crazy? Crazy. Oh, Seuss. And this Coming is the in thing. strong with the <laughs> article on human body facts today. You're really blowing my mind. But that's the thing is like we have so much to learn still. Oh, yeah. About what it is go- what is going on in our bodies. And there's it's we very hard to test. I mean, I read this other article about um, salt intake, which I'm very passionate well, yes, about. Yes, you are, I am, as am I. I salt, I'm a salt fiend. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know that I have a problem. I admit it. Mm-hmm. But there is discrepancy between amongst studies. Some say this is obviously bad. It raises your blood pressure, blah, blah, blah. And then others say absolutely not. We need salt and stuff like that. So they can't figure out how to do the study because nobody's going to want to volunteer for bland food for five years. Oh, no. And- <laughs> Nobody in this house, that's for sure. And so they want to do it. Guess with who? You can guess who they want to do the study on. Prisoners. Oh, oh no. Okay. Right? That's always our guinea pig when we run out of, like, options. Yeah. Are the prison people, prison population. and um, But they they still can't figure it out because let's say one group has reduced salt. Mm -hmm. Then that doesn't preclude them from using the commissary and buying a bag of Doritos. Right. Yeah. So, but, and I, I also know. think, you know, that because I think about the, the, the studies or things I've heard about MSG and how in, mm-hmm. in certain cuisines, like when it, when you're like mm-hmm. in Thailand, for example, like the MSG is really important to have there. And really all it is, is a, an isolated, like a, a sodium, what, like 
protein or whatever that's in the umami flavor. So like people get all hung up thinking it's like some chemical. It's like not. And uh, mm-hmm. um, uh, 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 so in, in an article I was reading about that and about how like MSG gets a bad rap, they were saying that it's very important in, in places where it's really hot and you're like sweating a lot that you need that sodium in the food to like hold on to water. Right, that and makes sense. And so I wonder if it's more that, that it's hard to do these studies because some yeah. of the variables that we need in order to see the effects, whether they be positive or negative, are more like environmental and like the there are more things going on and like we have to consider the other variables in there because you can't really isolate those and then get, get like, um, what do they call it? Uh, 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 Control group. Ca- yeah, and like ca- causation not yeah. correlation. Well, we talked about that too, about how the golden rule studies tend to be um, skewed towards white, yes. sort of upper class, whatever educated. And um, th- then we don't really learn everything we need to learn because right. it's not representative sample. This is like my mom who I was talking to about everything that's going on in the world. Mm-hmm. And she's like, everyone I know <laughs> lo- is loving this. We're returning back to w- our roots and, you know, working, just eating at home and being with each other. And I'm like, mom, who are these people? Are they all old? Right. And she's like... Oh, yeah, they are. I'm like, well, yeah, because they don't have to worry as much about their income, getting losing their job, taking care of their babies, making sure that their family doesn't get sick. I mean, right. of course they're fucking happy. Right. And oh, my God. She, it's like she looks around the room yeah. and sees who's there, takes a poll, and thinks that's a representative sample. And that's right. sort of what scientists do on a bigger scale. Yes. Oh, so God. And you know what? And when it is so hard, you know, and I think about people who are conducting this research or even myself when, you know, I was in like my research methods class and trying to, you know, conduct studies and, and put groups together. It was so hard to get a, yeah. a large like sample size. Mm-hmm. You really do. And, and you're you're focused so much on, on getting, you know, the the there's all, often like a limited amount of time that you have to do it in. You're You're answering to, you know different like academic whatever organizations like if you're getting grants or or anything like that and you don't have uh, like the opportunity to really I don't know I I can see their their like the 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 desperation of some of these researchers who I'm sure like grad students and like you know Yes, I do not think it's intentionally right. misleading. I think we just don't have a lot of options. And right, use what you can. Use what you can, and that happens to be what's you know like. And the people who were in our class were far uh, more willing to participate than when we went out on campus and tried to just get, or went out into the community and tried to get people to respond to surveys and things like that out there. Because like, if you've tried to get. Like you've been on the other side of it, you know, when somebody asked me, would you like to participate? I'm like, yes, I will, because I know how hard it is. I know, you know, I, I was in your shoes once and so I'll return mm-hmm. the favor, but that's it. Yeah. I mean, and there are consequences too. Like, let's say we're just talking about prisoners. Ugh, yeah. Um, if you're uh, screwing around with their food, that oh, is my currency God. in Absolutely. prison. Absolutely. Don't do food that. Food is you know, something that you can barter and it, it controls a lot of power and all of that. So I think that that should be taken into consideration. Yeah. But I do hope if they do this study that we find that the more salt, the better. Yeah, yes, that would be nice. You know, definitely. <laughs> but we're, we're just already uh, uh, using that um, rule in our house. So. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes. Um, okay. My next question for you is about the... First lady, not Melania, but just the position of being first lady. Yes. Um, don't you think it's some bullshit the, that you have to work bullshit. your ass off such and not bullshit. make any money at the, all? The worst. It's awful. And they're working like, well, you know, when they're certain women in that role are, t- yeah, it's so dumb. It's so dumb. There's so much pressure and responsibility placed on these spouses, all of whom have been women thus far. <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, and then also I was reading this article about it. It was in the Atlantic. It was called, I think the politics of being first lady yeah. or maybe it was the gender, gendered nature of being first lady. Cause it was talking about how their causes historically are almost always, um, sort of stereotypically yeah. feminine related to the family in a way. 
Yeah, like education, healthcare, mm-hmm. eating better, mm-hmm. um, even like Melania Trump's campaign of like non bullying and like helping kids. Oh, yeah. <sighs> it's all just sort of like feminine ideology. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I just, I find it really weird that we expect so much from these people who are not, they're not public servants. Yeah. I do think it's one of those jobs that like all of politics where it's, um, there's a name for it too, where you're, it's like not just the role of the person, like the pre, how do I describe it? Where the wife by default has a job because the Mm -hmm. man is in this role. Yeah. Like they're like the schmoozer or they, you know, and for a while I was, I had, I was in that kind of position where like part of my role is in being, you know, married to who I was married to. It was that I had to, you know, entertain people at, at, you know, events and yeah, you make a really good point because this certainly is not limited to just the president's wife. Yeah. There's Um, a name for those, those kind of jobs though. And I remember talking about this in like a women's studies class and being super frustrated being like, yeah, I know I'm in one of those. (laughs) Well, cause whenever, um, Hillary Clinton was the nominee, um, and people were sort of assuming she would win. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of talk about what it'll be like to have a first husband or first gentleman or whatever they would call him and how strange that would be. And I think only then will we start to see how the role is so stupid. Correct. Period. Ab- oh my gosh, you are so right. Because you see how it's yes, like an ornamental, yes, yes, weird yes. Blah, blah, blah. How Now, how is this role handled in other countries or is it? That is a great question. I've never thought about that in my life. Oh my God, Susie, thank you. Anytime <laughs> so you tell me it's a good right question, now. I'm always like, oh, I got Susie's wheels turning. This is great. Yeah, you did because I have never given that a thought because I, mean, I like, wonder. There's a lot of women who are leaders in other countries. I think it's probably similar because mm-hmm. I have seen, you know, like when the president and the first lady go to another country and they do that sort of ceremonial handshake bullshit. Yeah. There's usually the spouse of whoever there too. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so I suppose do, they're expected to, to. Yeah, it's so dumb. Yeah, I'm gonna have to gonna have to dig into that a little bit and see how they <laughs> even they even how they get written up and and just, and talked about in like the press. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm I'm curious. I think that they can do great work, and they can look. You know how it's all about. Oh, what did they oh, wear today? Yes, yes, yes. But it can bring attention to worthy causes and stuff. I don't think it's useless. I just think it's an right. odd setup. Yeah, it really is. Okay, next question. Mm-hmm. Good. Why good talk. this <laughs> good talk? This was in the New York Times. I'm like dipping into the, my archives because you know everything else is about what's going on in the world, mm-hmm. and I mm-hmm. just want to stick with like what we love. Yeah. But this was an article from I think 2018, and it was why do we reward bullies? It's mm. Kind of speaking of Melania's campaign, which mm-hmm. is about anti-bullying, um, that. We all, as collectively as a society, claim that we are anti-bully, anti-bullying, but in practice, we sort of reward them both on, as we know, reality TV, but also in politics and sometimes celebrities and things like that. Yeah. Um, what do you, why do you think we are inconsistent about I'm that? trying to think of a t- we were, where we would reward a bully. I need an example. Well, Johnny Bananas, number Ooh, one. Yeah. <laughs> there's an example. I, but Trump know, is a bully. It goes, it, uh, there's part of me that thinks, is it one of those, um, like, you love to hate him? Oh, like, yeah. That we love for sure. to be united in, in, in not liking somebody. And like we need Ooh. a villain. We need a... Yeah, maybe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This was saying that for, for starters, we all have selective ethics. Yeah. That like my bully, I would call a truth teller. But your bully is a horrible person. Right? So like the rules are different depending on whether I like the person or I don't. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of people might oh, I see, see yeah. Trump as a truth teller, whereas Got if you it. don't like Trump, you'd see him as a bully. Totally. And then it was saying like people oh, yes. are paradoxically attracted to bullies, um, that we kind of admire the power and we want the security that having a bully in your corner can mm. mean. 
And it's like as long as they're not directing their energy at me, I better be mm-hmm. on their side. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's like yeah. a security and safety, like some somewhere deep down, it's like a primal thing of like, I got to laugh at the bully so that they don't direct, so that the bully knows, oh, ha, ha, I'm on your side. Yeah, on so your you side. can't turn around and, and come after me. That's well, because I, I was think. thinking about like Harvey Weinstein, how he was notoriously a bully just outside mm-hmm, of the, mm-hmm. the raping. <laughs> he was also known for having t- a terrible temper and berating people publicly. But if he loved you, you would feel so good, you know, that this tyrant was endeared to you. Maybe that's part of yeah. it too. Yeah, ooh, that's gross. But it was saying how bullies love an audience and so yep. they often commit their crimes in front of a lot of people. Um and when they studied the reactions, 21% sided with the bully, what? 25% sided with the victim, and then 54% or so were neutral that people don't want involved. Well, mostly. you might as well say you're siding with the bully if you're neutral. Yeah. Right. That's true. Damn. They just stay quiet. I like to say I would not. I would. But I also have- I know you I, wouldn't. I also know that in my- that that's only because of my own- uh, uh, the how- I can only say that now that my self-worth mm-hmm. is higher than it was when I first started on the challenge because I think mm-hmm. back, I mean, everybody remembers this when I laughed at the plunger thing that mm-hmm. in a way there was like me laughing with kind of like the bullies who were doing that and I didn't want to be the one, I didn't want to be the one picked on so I kind of just like joined in with the group and now I think I would have reacted much, way different. Yeah, I agree with you. I yeah, think that totally. you would react differently on that uh, in that scenario, but also day to day, you're known for sort of piping up. Yeah, yes, I am known for that. <laughs> That's kind of your brand now. It's my brand, yes. <laughs> um, but like, I've definitely bullied people. It's weird how when you're bullying people, though, you well, at least I didn't know that's what I was doing until everyone then told me later when they watched it on TV. Yeah. Yeah, because you're kind of in a, a, a self preservation, like you're it's it's bullying is a defense mechanism. Mm-hmm. Bullying is hiding a part of you that feels like not kind of like that self worth the self worth of a bully is low. So yeah. they have to use other people and put down other people to make themselves feel better. So I don't know. I was reading oh, this well, study like a, a while ago where it said you know, people tend to want to believe that bullies are actually really insecure, but they were like, no, they're not. They they love themselves. And I was surprised. Uh, yeah. I don't know about that. Yeah. You know, it might be like on paper and reported, but eventually they, I, I do think that they suffer from the um, interpersonal relationship issues and like relationship conflicts and things like that down the road. And mm-hmm. that's when it becomes a problem. Right. When those same tactics, when those same coping strategies or their sa- those same attempts to, I don't know, raise your own, like raise your social status or whatever, mm-hmm. don't work. And you're in an environment where that doesn't yeah. work anymore, then you have to, ma- then maybe you start doing some self-reflecting and go, oh, I was a bully. Right. Like when you're not on the challenge anymore. <laughs> That's for sure. Right? But I mean, I don't think that should be seen as indicative of your character in general sometimes it is but i don't think it's necessarily the case that those right. circumstances are extreme totally and very different from normal life yes and you're Did looking you at see- people at that certain age in their life where they're they're supposed to be kind of like defending who they are and 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 fighting for their i don't know it's just like yeah you won't see that same kind of if you put a bunch of people in their 40s in a house together nobody's gonna bullet them i as- wonder that's yeah. a good that would be a fun little study. Yes. Do you think, this is my last question for the day. Do you think people are judging you? Like if you're at the grocery store, do you think people are looking in your cart and assessing, I don't know, what type of person you are? I don't have the answer. I'm just curious what you think. Um, I, sometimes yes. Yeah. I mean, I don't ever do think ever about it. I don't, cart? the only, I don't ever look in people's carts, but I have, the only time where I think I've done this is when I'm going to like, it's like late night and I'm, you know, stopping by the grocery store for something. And I've seen that guy and it's always a guy who's like in the sweatpants. He looks like he just put down his controller from playing Call of Duty and like hasn't taken a shower in three days. And on his, on the, uh, uh, uh on the, uh, uh, 
what the heck do you call those things where you the put belt, your food yeah. on the belt mm-hmm. conveyor belt is like Doritos, Mountain Dew, and like <laughs> like you know. Uh, what are those stereotypical yeah like that and like ho-hos and i'd be like well your diet <laughs> is contributing to your depression and maybe you, like so that i can but i see like the sadness there i don't judge and be like oh that person's eating awful food i i like want to intervene and give them my card one time i had to buy a pregnancy test as you do oh, yeah and i was feeling very self-conscious about it because like you know it's a private thing and this is a public transaction and I remember this. The CVS clerk was like, "Good luck." Oh God! And I was like, "Don't no, make no, no, no comments." Yeah, we have a social contract here. You yeah. are supposed to pretend like you don't even notice what I'm buying, and then we carry on about our day. Like you do not ever comment no. on what someone buys. Definitely not. That is like an unspoken rule of the 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 grocery clerk. I don't know. Somewhere. It's got to be in their handbook. Yes, there's a code of there's honor. There's a code, a code, a code, a code, for sure. And they're vi- <laughs> seriously violating that. Yeah, don't comment. I do wonder, though, like if people sort of feel weird about what they put in their cart or if mm-hmm. they think there's like an invisibility cloak around it and mm. nobody's noticing. I always love when like people just hide, like the, like, the attempts to hide it, like, oh, I'm going to go <laughs> in and buy uh, condoms, but I'm also going to buy like magazines and some, you know, like. I would totally do that. Me too. And I've done that. And then I've been like, what the fuck is wrong with me? Just buy the condoms. It doesn't help. Yeah. But, you know. Yeah. All right. No further questions. (laughs) You're off the hook. I want to thank everybody for buying our merch. It means so much. Oh, yes. And being our patrons on patreon.com slash brain candy. Subscribing to the show. Telling a friend. Tagging us on social. It all helps us. We we love you guys. So grateful. Yes. All right, everybody. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.